É, bom dia a todo mundo. Vocês estão me ouvindo? Morning, everyone. Can you hear me from, from, the, from the YouTube channel? Someone that is in the YouTube channel, please say hello. Yeah, we are live. Uh, so, morning, everyone. Uh, we are following up on our seminar series from the Biology Institute. And today our seminar will be in English. And, uh, and for a very good reason, today we have Jennifer Funk with us and, uh, and that we'll talk about like a trait-based approach for understanding ecological process and ecosystem management. And uh, just a few words about, so first, uh, thank you so much, Jen, for being with us. It's very early in the morning in California, so be very kind. And uh, so, so I think it's a double thank you just because of that. And um, and I, I'm I'm very happy to have Jen here. She's a, a reference in my field in in functional ecology. So many many people from from our department are here today, and and we are very happy to do that. And just for you to know a little bit about who is Jennifer Funk and uh, and her background for 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 uh, the talk today. So Jennifer is an associated professor in plant science at University of California, Davis, I will read a bit. Um, so she has an under, undergraduate degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and PhD of Stony Brook University. She has conducted her postdoctoral research with Peter Vitusek at Stanford University, which many of you may know from his like a very well-known work on nitrogen cycles. Uh, she recently moved uh, to University of California, Davis, from Chapman University, where she was a faculty for, for 13 years. She was on the faculty for 13 years. She studies how plant functional uh, traits drive ecological processes, such invasion, community assembly, and, um, assembly and uh, nutrient cycling. Uh, her, her approach combines theory and experiments, and her findings have increased our understanding of plant resource use, performance, and competition. Uh, she's particularly interested on how invasive species outcompete native species for resource in arid and nutrient poor habitats, and how to use that information to restore native plant communities. She has worked in this extensively in Hawaii and now five Mediterranean climate ecosystems. So, so she has a lot of uh, tell, she has a lot of to, to tell to us today about uh, many interesting subjects. So, so with this, I would like to, uh, to invite Jennifer for her talk. And Jen, if you, if you want to, to share your, your screen, I will add to, and I will be here. So, uh, just a uh, quick, some some informations before we move. Um, the questions here should be asked in in English, of course. Otherwise, she won't be able to understand it. But but you, if you feel more comfortable to to ask questions in Portuguese, which sometimes is the case, I, I can do my best to try to translate it. So don't be shy. Just because of English, of the language, just type your, your question and I will do my best to try to capture what, what you mean. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you all for being here and thank you, John, for, for being here with us. And uh, so let me just share screen and I will be in the background here. Great, thank you. So just to confirm, you can see my slides, correct? Well, I hope so. I hope you can see my slides. All right, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk today about functional traits and how you can use them to understand a variety of ecological processes and also to direct ecosystem management. So what is a functional trait? Um, it's defined as a morphological, physiological, or phenological trait that impacts plant fitness indirectly via the effect of that trait on plant growth, reproduction, and survival. 
And over the last few decades, community ecologists in particular have been really excited to link functional traits to plant growth strategies. So for example, you might have some species on one end of a spectrum that grow really quickly, like annual species, and there are going to be a suite of plant traits that correspond with that growth strategy. So fast growing plants typically have thin tissues that they don't allocate a lot of structure to. So they might have low leaf mass per unit area. They might also have lower or sorry, higher concentrations of nutrients in order to increase their photosynthetic rates because they want to assimilate as much carbon as possible to support that rapid growth. And on the other end of the spectrum, you might have slower growing plants like perennials or woody species. And these are gonna have the opposite set of traits. So they'll have more robust tissues that they retain for a longer period of time. And rather than focusing on acquiring resources, these species will actually try to use those resources very conservatively. So they might increase their resource use efficiency. And of course, there's gonna be a lot of species that are in between these ends of the spectrum. So ecologists have used these growth strategies to help us understand a variety of things, including how species respond to changes in the abiotic environment, as well as um, uh, biotic interactions. So competition and, and interactions with herbivores and things like that. They've also helped us understand trade-offs in plant form and function, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. One really great thing about functional traits is that it's helped us understand processes across scales. So you can use the same framework to ask questions like at the plant level, at the community level, and even at the ecosystem level. So for example, you can use it to understand how individual species respond to changes in biotic and abiotic factors. At the community level, a lot of folks have been interested in using functional traits to understand how whole communities assemble. So what are the assembly rules? How do you predict which species will occur in a certain community? And then if you know that species composition is changing, how might that scale up to influence processes such as productivity or rates of nutrient cycling? So um, I've been working across a lot of these scales over the last 20 years. But today I'm gonna to focus on, uh, well, I'm gonna tell you a few stories about three things that I've been working on most closely, and that's using functional traits to understand invasion dynamics, restoration of degraded ecosystems, as well as predicting and understanding how plants respond to drought. So I'm gonna start with invasion. So um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, an invasive species, my definition of an invasive species is a non-native species that spreads out of its area of introduction, reaching high local abundance at a site. So my definition doesn't have anything to do with an, an invasive species having deleterious impacts on a system, although we know that they can. So this is a picture from Southern California where I've done a lot of research and the dominant native community here, this is all coastal sage scrub, which is composed primarily of deciduous shrubs and quite a bit of uh, forb and, and grass understory. But um, annual grasses and forbs from the Mediterranean basin have invaded a lot, large parts of California, and they completely just dominate where they become invasive. Um, so you can see, I bet if you went back to this site right now, all this native vegetation would be gone and it would just be uh, this monospecific stand of black mustard, which is an invader. And this invasive species, so it has bad impacts on the system because it displaces the native plants and there's a lot of wildlife and, and other, um, uh, well, there's wildlife that depends on those native plants, but these species also change the fire regime in the system. So during our, this time of year uh, for us in California is when it's really hot and dry and it can be very windy. And these invasive species basically are just very dry and they can light on fire and spread fire really quickly. So this is one of the reasons why California, um, what, why fire has increased so much in severity in California. So the general paradigm in invasion biology is that invasive species tend to do really well 
in resource rich disturbed environments because they need a lot of resources. So if you think back to the, um, this tra trade off we talked about earlier, invasive species should be clustered more on this end of the spectrum where they require, they have high rates of uh, resource acquisition in order to support high rates of photosynthetic rate and high growth. And there might be some other traits that are associated with that as well. Um, and this is in contrast to native species, which are usually adapted to pre-disturbance conditions, lower levels of resources. And so they have a suite of traits that, that is more aligned with resource conservation. So that's been the general paradigm. And so one of the things that we didn't know until recently is, is how the invasive species, like what they did with their resources and how they were able to use those resources in order to grow faster uh, and, and outcompete the, the native species. So here's a diagram showing different ways that might happen. So in one case, Invasive species might just be better able at acquiring resources. So at a given site, they're able to access more resources than the native species. So here's a, a trait trade-off that's pretty common in ecology. So the x-axis is showing the amount of nitrogen in a leaf, and the y-axis is showing photosynthetic rates. And these are, these are both on a mass basis. And so we know that there's a positive relationship between nitrogen concentration and photosynthetic rate. So the more nitrogen you have in the leaf, the more photosynthetic enzyme, and so the, more the higher the photosynthetic rate. So one possibility is that the invasive species are kind of over here on this curve where they're able to acquire more nitrogen, and therefore they can sustain higher rates of photosynthesis. But some of my colleagues in Australia had suggested that the invasive species might actually be doing something different with that nitrogen. So rather than having a similar slope, they might actually have a different slope or they might, may have a different elevation. So for the same amount of nutrient, they're actually able to do something different biochemically. So maybe they're allocating more of that nitrogen to photosynthesis at the expense of cell wall protein or defense compounds. And so biochemically and physiologically, they're doing something very different rather than just being able to access higher rates of nitrogen. So we decided to test this. And we, uh, I worked with an international team of scientists and we decided to work in um, all five Mediterranean systems. Uh, Mediterranean systems are very threatened um, because mostly they're fantastic places to live. And so a lot of the native plants have been displaced for development. Um, they're also subject to um, changes in climate. So a lot of these areas, as I'll talk about later, are getting drier and warmer with climate change. And they've also been um, experiencing a lot of degradation due to invasive species. So we decided to work in all five regions. Um, they also are very good wine producing regions. And I think that's very important when choosing field sites as well. All right, so what we found, we, we surveyed a bunch of invasive and native species in these regions. And so here I'm showing a couple of these leaf trait relationships. Here's the one that I showed you in the previous slide with nitrogen concentration versus photosynthetic rate. And the invasive species are these filled symbols and the native are the open symbols. And what you can see is there's really no difference in slope or elevation. It's just that the, in, the invasive species are shifted further along on this axis, meaning that they tend to acquire nutrients, um, they have higher rates of nutrients, and they're using those in similar ways. Um, and, and in this case here, they're just making thinner leaves, which then correspond with higher rates of photosynthesis. So really, they're not doing anything drastically different biochemically. We also, um, you know, we looked at this across eight different plant communities in those five Mediterranean regions. And we found um, some interesting differences with respect to resource use. So here on the left axis, this is the leaf economic spectrum. Okay, and so this takes a bunch of different leaf traits and kind of puts them into this, um, this one axis that explains um, this conservative versus acquisitive trade-off. So higher values here mean that the plants have a more acquisitive strategy than the conservative strategy. 
So in this case, the invasive species that are in orange here tended to be more acquisitive with respect to leaf traits than the native species, but only in the plant communities where the native plants tended to be woody. Okay, so we sampled three woodlands, two in Australia and one in Chile, and then three different shrub systems, two in South Africa and one in California. So in this case, the, the difference in resource acquisition was just due to the fact that the annual or the invasive species tended to be annual. And we know that annual species don't live very long. And so they never have a reason to be conservative with their resources. They always want to prioritize uh, growth and, and resource acquisition. Whereas the native species in those systems don't, don't have that. They're perennial generally, um, and they don't need to reproduce that first year so they can be more conservative. However, we didn't find any differences in resource acquisition between native and invasive species in the two grassland systems that we sampled. And in that case, the native species, there are perennial species there as well, but a lot of the, the native species are, na are, in, are annual. So that suggests to us that a lot of these differences that we see, at least in Mediterranean systems, can be explained by differences in life form. But we know that in some of these systems, in particular California grasslands, the invasive species do outcompete the natives. So what then is driving invasion in these systems if it's not differences in resource acquisition? So to answer that, we did a competition study in a California grassland where we grew a bunch of native species in competition with annual ryegrass. Okay, so this is Festuca perennis and it's a, um, an annual invader in California. So what we did was we went into the regional species pool and we measured traits of all of the native species that we could find that were present in large enough numbers. Um, we did measure some traits of invasive species, which are noted by asterisks, uh, because we were just curious to know if those species were more functionally similar to the invasive species. And in California, at least, there aren't a lot of very, um, there aren't a lot of native annual grasses. Most of the annual grasses we have in California are actually uh, not native. So we, again, we're trying to find native species that might be functionally similar and, and therefore be very good competitors. So there's a, an ecological theory called the, the theory of limiting similarity, which suggests that species that are really good competitors with each other um, are so because they're using traits or they're using resources in very similar ways. So we measured traits that pertained to how plants were using light, water, and nitrogen. So we measured photosynthetic rate, light, water, and nitrogen use efficiency. We measured leaf nitrogen concentration, mostly as a proxy for how, how much nitrogen plants needed. We looked at leaf mass per unit area, three different root traits. So we looked at root to shoot ratio, which is just the amount of biomass that's allocated above versus below grounds. We measured rooting depth, which tells us you know, how, how the plants are accessing water. And then specific root length, which I'm gonna be talking about a bit. This is essentially a measure of the thinness of the root. And the thinner the root, the more surface area it has per unit volume. So it's actually really effective at taking up water per amount of biomass that's been invested in that root. So you can think about this as uh, below ground resource uptake efficiency. And then we also looked at plant height and seed mass. And then from this big list of species, we actually identified species that were functionally similar to the annual ryegrass and ones that were dissimilar. And these are just the Euclidean distances. Um, so the scores that are closer to zero mean that in this multi-dimensional trait space, that that species is more similar to the, the annual ryegrass. And in fact, one of the other invasive grasses was the most functionally similar. So we included it in our competition trial, even though it, in a restoration context, we would never plant that. We just wanted to know if this species was going to be the best competitor.
So what we found was that the successful competitors tended to be ones that diluted their leaf nitrogen concentration and used that to make more above ground biomass. But they also tended to be really good at taking up below ground resources. So let me walk you through this figure. On the y-axis, we have biomass decline of the ryegrass. Okay, so the higher this number, the more effective each competitor was at suppressing the growth of the invasive species when they were being grown in these competition trials. Okay, and so this is root to shoot biomass ratio, leaf nitrogen concentration and specific root length. So the better competitors are up here. And again, they had lower leaf nitrogen concentration. So they weren't trying to increase their, their photosynthetic rate like at the leaf level, but instead they diluted that leaf nitrogen to make more above ground biomass. So here the better competitors tended to allocate less to below ground compared to above ground. So this is a really great strategy if you're competing for light and you want to shade out your neighbor. The idea is to dilute the leaf nitrogen and make as many leaves as possible. Um, and then also the, the good invaders tended to be really good at taking up nutrients and water from the, from the, from the soil. So I'm gonna come back to the strategy a little bit later in the talk, um, but it might be that the invasive species are succeeding in this system because they have the strategy and the good competitors of the native community are the ones that also have the strategy and so they're able to suppress the growth of the, the invader. All right, the last thing that I wanna talk about with respect to invasive species is that you could potentially use functional traits to understand the evolutionary potential for invasive species. So at least in Mediterranean systems like California, um, climate change is supposed to make it drier and warmer. And if invasive species need a lot of resources, potentially this will be disadvantageous for them if it gets drier. And hopefully that will give a, a boost to the native species that are already really well adapted to drier habitats. So we decided to test this um, in some invasive annual grasses to see, you know, are they able to evolve um, in response to drought? So we took advantage of a long-term, well, relatively long-term five-year water manipulation where um, they were, they had three different water treatments in these grassland plots, an ambient water treatment, and then a 40%, 30% water addition and a 30% water reduction treatment. And so what we did was we went into those plots after five years of treatment and we took, we collected seeds from the invasive species and we grew them in a common garden for two years to get rid of any maternal effects. And then we looked for phenotypic differences across these populations. And if we found them after two years, we can infer that these were a result of natural selection. So what we found was that in the drier treatments, and of course this experiment happened during a natural drought. So the ambient treatment really is also a very dry treatment. The two drier treatments, those species or those individuals tended to flower earlier in the season and they also made more seeds. And this, this combination is consistent with a drought escape strategy. So if you are an annual plant and you sense that it's getting drier and that you might die, you wanna speed up your phenology to ensure that you make seeds before you die. And so this was really surprising to us because we were growing these plants in very well watered conditions <laughs> it, you know, in a greenhouse setting. And we saw these, these, geni these genetically based differences. And so this suggested to us that after just five years of drought, these invasive species are able to adapt to, um, at least with respect to their phenology and reproductive uh, physiology. But we weren't able to assess if the co-occurring natives could also adapt under such short time frames because there just weren't native species that were present across all three groups after five years. Um, but one of my current PhD students, Catherine Brafford, is, is looking at this for her dissertation. So we again took advantage of a six year rainfall manipulation in Northern California grasslands. And instead of just focusing on invasive species, we're gonna be looking at 14 species 
some native, some invasive, some grasses, some forbs, some annual, some perennial, to try to look uh, to see if there are any patterns that we can draw in which species are able to adapt on such short time scales to drought. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about how you use functional traits to restore ecosystems. All right, so this is a framework that some colleagues and I developed over 10 years ago now. Um, so let me walk you through this complicated slide. Um, so in this case, the native species are in blue and the invasive species are in orange. And each one of these symbols corresponds with a different type of species. So maybe the stars are legumes and the circles are grasses. And you start out with the regional species pool. So that's you know, every species that could occur at a local site. But in order to get to that local site, the species have to go through a series of filters. So the first is a dispersal filter. So if they can't get to a local site, they can't exist there. If they do arrive there, they then have to go through a resource filter, which means for plants that all of the abiotic conditions have to be right. So there has to be uh, ample water or nutrients or light. Soil texture has to be right for that species. Um, if that, those conditions are met, the species then have to go through a biotic filter, which is really means that competition from the resident plants also things like being able to withstand the herbivores and pathogens at a site. And increasingly, we're realizing that beneficial uh, mycorrhizae and other, and other microbes um, are needed for, for some plants to establish as well. So over here on the left, you have your unassisted community where most of the species in your community are ones that aren't desirable. So I'm using the context of invasion here, but you know, if you're restoring for other reasons, um, you know, you, it, it might be you know, different types of species that you don't want in your system. And over here, you're trying to, you know, these are the species that you want. This is your restored community. So in this paper, we, we developed a conceptual framework where if you understand trait differences across these species, you might be able to manipulate these filters in order for the desirable species to pass through, but you can block the undesirable species. So for example, if you know that invasive species are getting into your restored watershed because they're hitching a ride on the legs of ungulates, you might put up a fence in order to prevent those ungulates from dispersing seeds into your watershed. Um, also, you know, if invasive species require lots of resources, you might try to lower resources by you know, getting a canopy established to lower light at the forest floor, or you might add carbon to the soil to bind up a lot of nutrients that might have been deposited through pollution or agricultural use. So these are ways that, you know, if there are trait differences between the, in my case, native and invasive species, you could potentially modify those filters. So today I'm just gonna share a couple of stories with you about how we've used this framework to try to restore um, degraded communities. So the first example is a, a large restoration project that occurred in Southern California um, where we, we started with a 25 hectare watershed that was completely dominated by black mustard, an, an invasive form. And what we tried to do was to reestablish native dominated grasslands and coastal sage scrub communities. And I did this project in collaboration with, the, with uh, several academics from UC Irvine and also from resource managers at the Irvine Ranch Conservancy. Uh, whose job it is, is to actually manage these lands. So we used this, this functional trait approach. We assumed that if a lot of the dominant invasive species were annual forbs, that perhaps the native forb group uh, would be the, the ones that are most competitive with the, the invasive species. So we created different seed mixes. So we had one for the grasslands we were trying to restore, we had some for the coastal sage scrub communities. So for example, in the grasslands, we had a forb only treatment, a grass treatment, and then one that included both. And then for the coastal sage scrub, we had a forb grass shrub, and then one that included all three of them. And so we, we had these seven different seed mixes. And again, our thought was 
that the native Ford group in both of these cases should be the one that creates more invasion resistant communities because Forbes should have similar functional traits. But that is not what we found. So here, um, the very first year, uh, black mustard was the dominant invasive species. And in subsequent years, we actually had a switch to two different invasive species. These are um, those thistles. And so the first year, um, we found that essentially the uh, invader performance, well, how about this? Across all three years, invader performance tended to be lowest in the shrub dominated plots in the coastal sage scrub mixes. And there really wasn't a difference in the grassland communities uh, between these mixes. Okay, so it seemed that shrubs, once they got established, were really good at suppressing the growth of the invasive species, primarily because they get really big and they take up a lot of resources. So the functional group approach that we used didn't seem to work. It didn't seem to confer invasion resistance. But if we go back and we actually look at the trait values in plots that were the most invasion resistance, a, a familiar pattern emerges that I'm excited to share with you. Um, so these slides, the, the, the y-axis is the amount of black mustard biomass in a single plot. Each one of these is a, is a plot level metric. And these are community weighted mean values for different traits. Okay, so this essentially is, the, is like an average trait value of all of the native species in a plot. So and it's calculated by taking the abundance of each species, multiplying it by uh, its trait value, like for in this case, it's photosynthetic rate, and then averaging that across all of the species in the plot. And so at least for the north facing slopes, we saw this nice pattern where um, communities that tended to have lower photosynthetic rates had lower biomass of the invader. And if you look across all of these traits, we found that um, lower photosynth like so plots that had lower photosynthetic rate, lower water use efficiency, lower seed mass, lower root mass fraction, lower root tissue density, but high specific root length. These, this, these were traits that tended to repel invasive species. And these are very similar to the ones that we found in that competition trial. So this suggests that plants that, that decrease function at the leaf level, so they have lower photosynthetic rates, but they actually allocate more biomass above ground. So they have lower root mass fraction, so a lower amount going below ground. But they are making these very acquisitive roots that have high specific root length. This seems to be a trend that keeps popping up <laughs> in a lot of the studies that I'm doing, at least in California, where just making a lot of above ground biomass, but being really efficient at taking up below ground resources. This tends to be a good strategy when you are competing with these annual grasses and forbs from the Mediterranean basin. So hopefully armed with this knowledge, we can find, we can start planting native species that have these traits so that we can create um, communities, restored communities that are resistant to invasion. All right, the second project I wanna talk about is one where we're actually trying to use a trait-based model to achieve specific restoration goals, okay? And so this is work that I've been doing with Daniel Lachlan, who's at the University of Wyoming. And so his, the trait model, basically, you start with the trait matrix, okay? So you have species, by a bunch of trait values. And you tell the model which trait values you want to constrain and which trait values you want to diversify in order to meet a particular restoration goal. So for example, let's say we're trying to restore a grassland in California and we want to optimize drought tolerance because we know California is supposed to get drier. So we might want to constrain are selecting native species that have high rates of water use efficiency or high values of water use efficiency because we know that we want them to be, you know, that we don't want them to spend water um, quickly because it's going to get drier. So let's say we tell the model we want to constrain water use efficiency, but we tell, we also tell the model we want to diversify rooting depth. Um, so they're in community ecology, there's an idea that if you have a bunch of different rooting depths, then overall that community is going to extract more water 
than one where all the species have the same rooting depth. Because in that case, they're drawing water from the same area of the soil profile. But if you have rooting, different rooting depths, then that system, that whole community can use water more efficiently. Okay, so in this case, we might want to constrain water use efficiency, but diversify rooting depth. And the model will then tell you which, which species to plant and in what relative abundance in order to satisfy that trait profile that you've specified. Okay, so the model does require some knowledge of what trait values are ideal for the, the restoration goal you're trying to optimize. So we're testing right now this trait-based model um, in two different grassland communities. So one in an annual grassland in California, another in a mixed grass prairie in Wyoming. And we're trying to optimize for two restoration outcomes. One is drought tolerance and the other is invasion resistance. So here's an example for how we're doing this in the California system. We started with a species pool of 36 and we told the model to randomly draw four grasses and six forbs. So each one of our treatment plots is gonna have a total of 10 species. And we've created four different treatments. So the first is a drought tolerant treatment. So again, we had to tell the model what traits to look at and what values were gonna confer drought tolerance. So we said species that have high leaf mass per unit area, high seed mass, and high root diameter are going to be ones that are gonna be drought tolerant. For invasion resistance, we use this same suite of traits that I've been talking about. So low leaf nitrogen, uh, low root mass fraction, but high specific root length. Um, there's also some evidence in ecology that more functionally diverse communities um, have higher uh, ecosystem function, including invasion resistance. So one of ours was kind of a control treatment um, where we, we told the model to make it just as functionally diverse as possible. And then we had a random treatment as a real control. And so we have 25 replicates of each one of these four treatments. And we are exposing them to two different water environments. One is a drought and one is a, um, a little bit more water than the normal. And then we're exposing half of them to invasion by that annual ryegrass and half of them um, not. So we are in the second year of this project. And so I'm excited to have results from it soon. Um, but we're really excited about the possibility of this trait-based model being able to um, predict which species to plant in order to achieve different restoration outcomes. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about is drought response. So there are many different ways that plants can be successful in dry environments. And over the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, um, I think plant biologists have really considered these three different drought response strategies. So one is escape. And so a lot of annual species, maybe even herbaceous species fit into this where they pretty much only grow during the wet season. And so they, they escape drought altogether by just going dormant or ending their very short life cycle before it gets too dry. There's also some species that can avoid drought. So these are ones that might be drought deciduous like several of the shrubs that we have in California, or they might have really deep tap roots where they can access water year round. And so they never actually experience drought and they can avoid it. And then there's the, the tolerant plants. These are evergreen plants that live year round and they, just, they, they're, they don't have year round access to water and they just have to suffer through drought uh, at some point during the year. And it's quite likely that these three strategies map on to this resource trade-off that I've been talking about, where plants that have this escape strategy tend to have traits that promote resource acquisition and fast rates of growth, whereas these, um, these tolerant plants tend to be more conservative. Uh, but we don't really know because this drought response strategy framework has mostly been tested in either woody species or crop species, and not a lot in particular of herbaceous plants that aren't annuals. So like native grasses, bunch grasses, and, and other like shorter lived shrub species. And so um, one of the main um, areas of my research over the last decade has really been to try to understand how traits predict drought 
and try to develop a better framework uh, than just lumping species into these three categories. All right, so I'm just gonna again tell you a few stories um, about the work that we've been doing trying to understand how functional traits inform plant response to drought. And a lot of the work I'm gonna show you was um, collected by students that I've been working with, in particular, Julie Larson and Monica Nguyen, and about 100 undergraduate and high school students that I've been working with over the last um, yeah, 10 years or so. So the first project I wanna talk about is one where we were looking at four day old seedlings. So really, really young seedlings are incredibly vulnerable to drought. Okay, so they germinate and often it's a really big rain event that will trigger germination. And if there isn't another rain event for a month, that soil, especially at the top layer where the root is, can dry out pretty quickly. And so what we wanted to know was do these trait strategies that we normally find for adult plants, do they exist in very, very young seedlings? And what traits help promote tolerance um, if it gets very dry following germination? So what we did was we germinated seeds and grew them to four days old, put them in soil and then stopped watering them <laughs> to see how long it would take them to die basically. And we did this with forbs and grasses and we found that forbs here in the triangles tended to have higher survival time. So they were more drought tolerant. And those forbs tended to have larger seeds. So larger seeds actually have more resources for a developing seedling. And so that might help them you know, grow a bit faster and get their root system more established. Because the plants that actually allocated more below ground, this is root mass ratio, so plants that had that allocated more below ground and had more robust root tissues tended to be the ones that had higher survival. Okay, so at four days, um, we're already starting to see this pattern where allocating roots and root traits um, are important in drought response. We also did another potted plant study on six week old seedlings. And we used pretty much the same mix of forbs and grasses, but also some shrub species here. And we found this really nice trade-off um, with respect to root traits, where the forbs and grasses tended to have root traits that are aligned with high rates of resource acquisition. So high specific root length, fast growth rates of the roots, fast elongation rates. Whereas the shrubs tended to allocate more biomass below ground and have thicker, more robust root tissues that weren't as efficient at taking up resources. Okay, so we see this nice trade-off and this root trait, this root spectrum here is positively correlated with plant growth rate. Okay, so having these root traits is, 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 opt, is uh, beneficial for these fast growing forb and grass species. So they're able to to acquire those below ground resources that they need in order to sustain the above ground growth. Okay, so we see the importance of these root traits at six weeks old in these plants that were grown across different water environments. However, if you start asking these questions in adult plants in the field, root traits appear to not be very informative at all. So I wanna just give you a little bit of background on this field experiment that I'm gonna show you results from. So this was a, a large experiment where we subjected plants to three different water treatments. So an ambient treatment. So in California, that's about 330 millimeters of rain a year. And then we had a, a treatment that was half that and one that was um, one and a half times that amount. And we grew eight different species in these plots and uh, we grew them in these hoop structures. So every time it rains, we'd throw up the plastic tarp to shield them, and we'd add a known amount of water back via an irrigation system. And we had four different annual species, so two grasses and two forbs. And then we had four different perennial species. These are all common drought deciduous shrubs that you find in California. And again, we were interested in identifying which traits were linked to plant performance across different water treatments so that we could really identify traits that predict drought response in these species. 
All right, so let me walk you through this complicated slide. So these are our four annual species and our four perennial species. And these circles here represent the correlation coefficients between a, an individual trait and reproductive allocation. Okay, so we measured actually the reproductive effort of each individual plant in the experiment. So if that correlation is positive, there is a, a filled in blue circle. If it's negative, there's a filled in orange circle. Okay, so what the, the point that I wanna make here is that the annual species tended to show stronger relationships between traits and reproductive allocation compared to the perennials. Okay, so at least with respect to the leaf level traits or above ground traits, the annual species, the ones that allocated more to photosynthesis um, and less to conservative use of resources, those are the ones that tended to, to, to grow more essentially and make more seeds. There were a couple of um, perennials that, that aligned with that as well, but for the most part in these perennial species, we just didn't see very strong relationships between traits and reproductive allocation. And that might make sense because perennials live multiple years, and so you'd need to look at reproductive effort across the lifetime of that plant. So it's harder to assess these things in longer lived plants. But the point I wanna really make here is that root traits didn't seem to explain a lot of variation in reproductive allocation. We were expecting to find patterns like that shown for Bromus madratensis, one of the grass species, where plants that allocated more biomass to increasing the root length, so they had just more length per unit volume of soil and had thinner roots, we expected those ones, the, those are aligned with resource acquisition and that those would have um, positive correlations with reproductive allocation. And we did find that, but only for one species. And if you plug all of these traits into a structural, structural equation model to determine the relative predictive, predictive ability of the traits, we find that the leaf traits explain about 38% of the variation in reproductive allocation whereas the root traits only explain six. And so this was really surprising to me because root traits you would think would be very important in a dry environment where plants are growth is limited by water. But what I think is going on here is that we just focused on four traits like that are more, more really morphological root traits. And we know now that there are some plants that, that don't actually make thin roots that acquire resources themselves. Um, so there, there's an idea that some plants can outsource this to microbial symbionts. So the plant itself might make really robust root tissues, but then allocate a lot of resources to mycorrhizae, um, which have very thin hyphae that are very good at taking up below ground resources. So there are some species that like Bromus madratensis, that might do that work themselves, create a lot of root length and a lot of really thin roots to, to take up below ground resources, but then some perennial species in particular might make more robust tissues and rely on microbial symbionts to do that. So root traits might not correlate very well with reproductive allocation unless you're considering these mycorrhizal symbionts, which we did not in this experiment. So this is something that my lab will be focused on understanding over the next five to 10 years. All right, the last thing, I just wanna come back to this framework and just uh, reiterate that we don't know a lot about um, resource acquisition um, or, or I guess drought response in herbaceous plants generally. So the idea is that herbaceous plants should have this escape strategy but we know that's not true. If you look at species in a grassland, there's a lot of variation in how drought tolerant those species are. If you go back to that first slide that I showed you where the forbs tended to be really drought tolerant but the grasses weren't, um, at least at that early stage of life. Um, you know, what it, you know, so we know that there's differences. How do you explain those differences? And so we've developed a framework that might suggest different types of strategies for herbaceous plants. So rather than thinking about escape, avoidance, and tolerance, we might think about different strategies like growth, water use efficiency, and an investment strategy 
Um, these are just terms that I made up that might change as we test this framework. But the idea is that you could have plants that really only focus on growth. And this is that same suite of traits that I've been talking about where plants dilute their leaf nitrogen, make a bunch of leaf area, but are also really good at taking up uh, below ground resources. You might have some plants that allocate a lot of nitrogen to the leaves in order to increase their water use efficiency, but they're also very good at taking up water. Um, and then you might have an investment strategy. And so these are plants that actually allocate, that have really robust tissues that allocate a lot of uh, resources to, to making larger seeds. And what we find is that if you map these trait strategies onto drought resistance, which we determined by um, withholding water and seeing how long plants survived, um, the, the species that are more drought resistant tend to have these strategies, but plants that have this growth strategy are not drought resistant at all. So uh, again, over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna be testing this framework to see if it holds in herbaceous plants. And we're actually doing that, um, me and one of my PhD students, Brooke Wainwright, by taking advantage of this really nice rainfall gradient that California has. So in the deserts, we have grasslands that only get 220 millimeters of rain a year. And then all the way up in Northern California, we have some grasslands that get 10 times that, so almost 2000 millimeters of rain. And so we're basically going to grow populations uh, or individuals from all of these populations in a common garden and drought stress them and look to see which traits uh, correspond with drought tolerance uh, in those systems. All right, I just wanna end my talk by acknowledging all of the fantastic grad students, postdocs, undergrads, high school students uh, who helped me collect the data that I presented today. I'm also very grateful for my funding um, sources uh, and for, for your attention. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. Thank you, Jen, for the for the great talk. It's very nice to hear like uh, the summary of your work in 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 one piece. And uh, I think we had uh, a couple of questions, and some people were not able to post in the chat for some reason. So I I have some questions here with me also. And uh, so let's start. So the very first question is a tricky one huh? from Laís Guadalupe Casalotti. She said, good morning. It's great to be able to watch your presentation. I'd like to know the impact of your research for us in Brazil. Are, are there research groups that do something similar? Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know enough about the vegetation <laughs> in Brazil. Um, Actually, I'm just putting together a grassland ecology class. And so I am learning that there are grasslands. There, there are many different types of grasslands in Southern in, in South America. Um, but yeah, I imagine the same, if, if those grasslands are dominated by perennial species and the invasive species tend to be annual, that a lot of these same approaches that I'm talking about could work to restore those communities. But you know, the trait-based approach can be used, I think, to restore any type of community. So even in a forested system, I mean, some of the work that I know of that's been done in Costa Rica, um, so some of Karen Hall's work has been really focused on trying to reestablish a canopy in order to lower the light availability, um, in order to kind of get rid of a lot of those um, gap species and the early successional species that will come in following a disturbance. And so, you know, establishing those canopy species is really important to kind of jumpstart the, the restoration. And so I think that these functional trait approaches can be used for restoration and to combat invasive species. But again, I just don't know enough about the specific systems in Brazil, unfortunately. But it sounds like the AZES group is also doing some interesting work, at least in palms, <laughs> trying to understand functional traits and performance. So yes, I know that some people are doing excellent work uh, in this area. Uh, if, if I may complement just so there, I think there is, a, is now a kind of blooming like a trait-based ecology uh, for restoration. And here in Brazil, it's not different. So we have like some, some groups working on. 
So here at Unicamp, there is the group from Professor Rafael Oliveira, and, and he sent me a question. I think I will follow up with this question. So, so his work is, is his group is working with trade-based approach, approach for restoration of Cerrado, that is a savanna-like uh, ecosystem here in Brazil, and also together with Chisleni Ganadi in, in the northeast of Brazil, there is a semi-arid area in Caatinga. They are also working with trade-based approach to restoration. And uh, there is another like more timid initiative in Amazon. So people are working. So I think it's Rita Mesquita and Katarina Jakovac, where, together with uh, Flavia Costa, that is more functional ecology. So I think here in Brazil, we have like uh, some initiatives. They're just projects that are starting. So uh, if you're interested, uh, let's just go and try to find these people here in Brazil. And, uh, and, and the framework work is just the same, the ecosystems that are a little bit different, but we learn from each other, I, I suppose. And uh, I think I will, I will follow up on Rafael's question. So it's a big one. And, and then it's a kind of in, in different parts by, by the program. So, so it's funny, I, I will post uh, each part. So Rafael asked it, uh, are, we are currently working on restoration of native savannas that have been replaced by, by pastures with African grasses in central Brazil, locally known as Cerrado. Invasion by Af African grasses is currently the main factor decreasing restoration success. So native soils are very uh, phosphorus impoverished, impoverished and, soil, and soil limiting is a key step to implementing pastures, to implementing pastures. In, invasive species are very, let's go to the next one, sorry. Very resource acquisitive and certainly favored by, by limiting. We, we, put, we put it ties that uh, limit soils are limiting the success of slow growing natives. Do you have any suggestion on what could on what we could do on soils to make uh, them more phosphorus impoverished? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great question. And I phosphorus is just not the element I have any experience with at all. Because in California, most of our, um, well, we have the, most of our grasslands are, are nitrogen limited, um, being in the, the temperate, zone and um, this the serpentine grasslands I've been working with in particular are very low in phosphorus already so we don't actually have this problem where we have too much phosphorus um, yeah and a lot of my colleagues that I've been working with in um, Australia have that same problem where they had, don't have enough phosphorus so so I don't know the answer to the question because <laughs> phosphorus you know it's not soluble and so i'm not exactly sure outside of just harvesting a bunch of biomass to maybe remove some of the organic nit or phosphorus from the system and I, again that would not be practical on large scales to, to to harvest a bunch of biomass and remove it from the system so i don't have a good answer for you i, think, <laughs> I wish I I could. he's asking just for every single person to say <laughs> can give an answer because yeah. it's a tricky one and and he also said that um so that both native and invasive are perennials in in their site mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and guadalupe said that she's very proud of brazil because we have a lot of restor trade-based restoration research going on here uh it's Great. good and that uh, so let me go i think i skipped that one question from from kathleen uh, Kathleen asked how to balance well the native species uh, against newly engineered species when thinking about decreasing the invasive, invasive plants. So newly engineered species, I think, are um, genetically modified crops, maybe, that are spreading. Is that, is that so how so if you can confirm that? this, Kathleen, and uh, <coughs> we can... But if they are, <laughs> yeah. Well, 
So yeah, I think the the trait based approach I think can work. So as long as you can identify differences between the native species and whoever the invasive species is, you know, potentially you could find a way then to exploit that difference and and try to to combat the invasive species that way. So I know, for example, a lot of the invasive species in our crop systems here in California, they really don't do well during dry years. So we've seen, you know, the, the removing the resources has been really good for them. Um, and I don't know enough about Brazil and and how climate is changing there. Like, is that is that potentially? Are you also experiencing droughts in some regions? So I mean, potentially some of these engineered species that require a lot of resources might might not thrive as the environment changes. Oh, thank, thank you, Jen. I think we have one more, more question from Felipe Rocha. He asked, can trait-based model be used to study systems with little understanding on relationship between trait and their fitness impact? Or there is a model more adequate to that? Thank you. And Rafael Oliveira also, thank you for the great talk. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, so we're just testing the trait-based model now. There was a, a European group that actually just published a paper a few months ago that, that they were actually the first ones to test this model that, that Daniel and I developed. But it was, um, I, I think that Unfortunately, the model does require some knowledge, uh, you know, or guess of, of what traits are going to be advantageous or lead to that restoration outcome that you want. Um, you don't necessarily need to show a relationship between a trait and fitness, like reproductive allocation. Um, oftentimes, you can you can make assumptions from the literature. I mean, even there there are a bunch of different worldwide, you know, trait analyses that show, you know, these traits are generally, you know, beneficial in arid systems or, you know, vice versa. So they, you know, there are some general patterns you can draw for across biomes, but oftentimes those might not hold in a specific community. So depending on what community you're working in, you might need to develop your own understanding of how traits relate to performance there. Um, but you can always start with these more global relationships and and start there and then see if those work in your community. Uh, good, thank you. And Philippe, ask if you could share the the, the reference for the paper. Uh, if you can send me later and, and I can just post here for, for everyone to know the, the one I think from the European group that just... Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think I will follow up on a question from myself, if I'm allowed to. So, so I think I'll just uh, discussion on on general global patterns do not holding true in local systems, and we have to understand uh, how how they're really related to fitness locally. And that uh, so just bring me to to something that I would like to ask you. So, what are your views on on generalizing community like? Um, structure and function patterns from from traits and not from species so so because this is as a someone trained as a community ecologist before the the functional trait like a, a fancy thing and uh we, we use it to look at species and and try to understand community process from from species as like a a whole phenotype and uh, but but more recently, a lot of people are trying to understand community structure and functioning, looking to the traits and uh, as they were being selected, like uh, not in together anymore. And uh, so so do, do you, how how do you see that looking looking like uh, ecosystems from traits, regardless regard of the species they they are boxed to or they belong to yeah well so i, I think it's, as it's, an, a, yeah, it's a spider as thing an, <laughs> as an advocate of the trait-based approach i'm always hesitant to point out weaknesses but there are yeah, yeah this is maybe i would like to ask you if you can if you can say about a, a advantage and disadvantage of of uh trait-based approach for that maybe you 
put you in a better situation. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fine. So what I what I'm wary of, or I guess cautious about, is that some most a community ecologists, I think in general, focus on a very limited set of traits. Okay, so you could go and look at leaf mass per unit area and height and seed mass because these are really easy to measure traits. But let's say they have really different, like one is an early season plant and one is a late season plant. You wouldn't want to you know, plant the late season species because it wouldn't compete with your invasive species. You know, so there's, there's a bunch of different things that you need to consider. Like it, I'm talking particularly about the context of restoration here and selecting species to, you know, to provide some sort of function for a system. But where do you draw the boundary? Like you can't possibly measure every single trait <laughs> on every single species, right? And so trying to determine which traits are the most important to, to measure, that's been something I've been really interested in. And so, you know, that's where I uh, differ, I guess, from a lot of community ecologists, because my background is actually in physiological ecology. So I'm very interested in thinking about how roots are, how, how roots work and how water is moved through the plants. And so really thinking more about these physiological processes that are harder to measure. And so a lot of the trait databases that we have don't include these, these traits. They include the, the limited set of leaf, you know, and, and plant level traits. So I guess to get at your question, I think we are losing a lot by just focusing on a, hand, a small handful of traits. And, but I do think it depends on the context. So you know, if you know that you know, in your system that phenology or you know, flowering phenology or pathogens, um, relationships with pathogens are really important, like those are traits that you should consider, you know, not just these economic traits that everyone else is measuring. So I don't know. I hopefully that's a good answer. I don't. Yeah, know. I think it is. It's just back to the context dependency thing because uh, something that it, for me is very hard to reconciliate is that every ecosystem evolved in a different like a uh, historical and um, first like a uh, uh, his uh, different histories and and different like a uh, uh, selection force operating and uh, so so the four traits that we can easily measure may not be the ones that are being selected but just correlate with something else in, in a given situation and so on so so I, I i'm always a bit cautious on on making a a full a full movement from species to to trade and then and i like to ask this question for for functional ecologists and, and learn from their perspectives i i got another question uh, also, that could that wasn't uh, someone that that's not here. This is from Dimitrios Martins. Also, he's a postdoc on on Rafael Oliveira's lab, and uh, working on this restoration efforts in 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 savannas. And uh, and he asked, it, uh, sorry, I I didn't have the time to type it. And uh, considering uh, trade based based restoration efforts. How relevant is uh, interspecific variation for for the restoration practice? And uh, because we know about the theory and so on, but how how, how this is important for practice? And uh, and he complemented when selecting for restoration uh, uh, initiatives, we normally consider species means so species that are more conservative and more acquisitive. Any suggestion on how could we account for interspecific variation when, when thinking about which species should we use in, in restoration? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this is kind of a controversial topic because a lot of uh, restoration practitioners have this idea that local is the best. And so you want to restore genotypes that are specific to that region. And you don't want to, you know, it, bring in populations from outside. Um, that and, and so we recognize that there is a lot of intraspecific trait variation, and for restoration, that might be really beneficial. So in California, we again we have this latitudinal gradient of rainfall. So as Northern California dries, 
we could be bringing in populations from Southern California that are more drought tolerant. <laughs> so the same species, just different populations, but there are a lot of restoration practitioners who don't want those genotypes introduced, you know, to, to I guess, erode the genetic variation that they currently have in, the, in their systems. So rather than treating, you know, rather than having a model that has species means, you could potentially have population means of different species and then try to choose populations of the same species for a restoration project, depending on their, their trait values. Um, but yeah, again, a lot of the trait databases just report means. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's, you know, and we know that the trait, the traits vary a lot across these populations. So including those in restoration, I think is important. And I think the trait based models can be used in that way. At this point, you might just, you know, include those populations as different species. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. And thank you. I think we covered all the questions here and, uh, and we are over one hour and 10. So, so I think with this, I would like to, to thank you all for being here and for the great talk uh, questions. And, uh, and, and especially I would like to thank Jen for being with us and taking our questions. And, uh, and I hope that next time we see each other in Brazil eh? and then we can show you around uh, our ecosystems and, uh, and restoration projects and so on. And uh, so thank you, Jen. Thank you very much uh, for being here. So, so the contacts for, for Jennifer Funk and her lab are and more information are in the description down below and for the video. So I think uh, you can you can get in touch and learn more about her work and uh, and her research from there. Okay. So thank you, Jen. Thank you very much, everyone. And I will end the the transmission now. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>